Hello, everybody. I'm Will. And I'm Kristen. And this is So I'm Watching Desperate Housewives, Season 1, Episode 3. Pretty Little Picture. <laughs> I, like all the other shows that we've revisited, was very scared <laughs> to revisit this because I don't trust myself and I was afraid that because this was largely my introduction, like leaving teen media into sure. adult media, I and I haven't revisited it other than memes. I I didn't have a frame of reference, and so I was part of. I was anticipating looking back and being like, Ugh. like when I was seventeen, this felt yeah. like it's not so bad. No, it's not. It it does it. it the edges show a little bit, the time period, you know. Well, it's very predictable. There's, like, a lot of very predictable, but yeah. they do zag when you think they're going to zig sometimes, which is welcome. <laughs> it just It's something that we say a lot, but it is a very good balance of tone. It, yeah. I said this in our previous coverage, but it, it is a nighttime soap opera, and it was my introduction to the concept of a soap opera. I never got into soap operas when we were in, like, school and stuff. Girl, you didn't watch Passion? No, I didn't. Grace is going to regret it if she goes up against old Tabitha. Isn't that right, Timmy? That's right, Tabitha. We're going to win. Mm, I was familiar with it, but I didn't watch it. <laughs> See if Will can get some access to passions. <laughs> and so I find that part of it very interesting. How, how different characters are sort of in different genres and mm -hmm. stuff. Because Paul and Zach are in an entirely oh, yeah. different... They're in a lifetime, like... Mrs. Warmington said she looked for Mom's obituary and couldn't find it. Did you put one in? I've had other things in my mind, Zach. I doubt people will give it much thought. Don't worry about it. Maybe when you die, I won't put in an obituary. That would be your choice to make. Assuming you outlive me. How, how far is too far enough? The Terry Palmer Lonergan story or whatever? Is that a real thing? No, it's the one that Anne says on um, Parks and Rec. There was this one, how far is too far enough? The Terry Palmer Lonergan story. I thought you had just made that up. No, oh my God. Imagine. I was really impressed. No, because she's like, it was about this woman whose therapist gets obsessed with her and tries to eat her toes. And like, <laughs> she was like, also her daughter was having sex way too young. <laughs> it, it's, it is just so funny because they are so serious. Yeah. And they are filmed so serious. Yeah. And Zach and is. And they are just sort of each like meandering through the this rooms. Dark their house, house. This dark house. This dark house. Just with their braided belts and tucked in shirts. And like when Paul was sitting at the table and Zach asked about the obituary, he was just like picking up each section of the newspaper, <laughs> looking at the front page of each section and then moving it to the side. There was a lot of weird physical <laughs> acting in this episode. That was one of them. And then Carl just kept touching himself under his shirt. <laughs> he was trying. A dinner party? It's tomorrow night, so if you could just keep Julie an extra day. Fine, but that's all. Brandy and I leave Sunday for a week up at the cabin. What cabin? Brandy wanted some place where we could get away. Okay, that one checks for me. Why? How? <laughs> because it speaks to his character that he's sleazy because I clocked it in like a mmm kind of way. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Because to me, I'm like, do you have mites? Why are you just touching yourself all over in the in the back under a shirt, in the front under a shirt? Just like <laughs> so weird. It's so funny too because you you were like, is her ex husband on the show? And I think I was like, I don't know, I don't remember. And I had to see him. Like yeah. literally, the second yeah. I saw him, I was like, oh, Carl is very yeah. much His on the show. His name is Richard Berge. He is so funny. He is funny. He's <laughs> it's well, okay. So I remember that I remember everybody being hot when I was like watching it at 20 i don't remember them looking like me like being oh. hot in a way that was more accessible this time around but Wait, we decide terry hatcher was like 40 yeah and i think felicity huffman's the oldest one he's so funny in that scene where she's in the towel yeah. and she's like trying to salvage this like experience speech yeah. that she has and he's just like he's he's gone full-blown peter hale i need an apology carl what 
An apology. You never took any responsibility for your behavior. <laughs> I don't know what to say, Susan. The heart wants what it wants. Like, mm. he's just blinking. He's so bitchy. Yeah. It, oh, God. It is a very bitchy performance. <laughs> and then I, how, do we know how long Brandy sticks around? Because Anne Dudek is a welcome addition to literally any okay, TV show. Okay, so hold on. So, as per usual, we have the four housewives. We have the four plots. Yeah. The overarching plot is that it was a month that Mary Alice had planned to have this dinner party. Yeah. And because of her death, everyone just sort of forgot and or didn't follow through with the plans. And so they decide to have the party in her honor. And so Lynette is grappling with the homework balance with her and Tom. Tom. Yeah. And Gabby still has her stuff uh, with John and all that. So anyways, uh, Susan is this this is our introduction to Carl and Brandy and she's trading uh Julie they so it's his weekend <laughs> he's taking her for the weekend I'm having a hard time <laughs> <laughs> and I like I I like Ann Dudek and I like the way that this played out because I did just check she's only in this episode Hey Brandy could you scoot a little Thank you. Hi, Brandy. I'm sorry for the way I treated you. I have built up a lot of anger towards you, and I realize now that I just can't carry that around anymore, so I'm moving on. Really? That's a bummer. That I'm is bummed. a... I think she just leaves him. Yeah. Like, I think he's just, like... That's fine. Up Schitt's Creek. Well, yeah. She was, like, booked and busy in the early 2000s, <laughs> so it's fine. There's a huge shadow looming over this episode and the show so far, and it is that all of the husbands, all of the men are terrible. <laughs> And that's where you're having a hard time. And so we know that he cheated on Susan yeah. with his secretary, Brandy, and that he left Susan for her. And yeah. we did watch Susan doing that, like, Y2K place blame on her. Yeah. And I think the Anne's performance of Brandy and the fact that she ends up being the one to realize what is happening, because Carl is far too willing to play into. Oh, for sure. If, as Carl is willing to play into anything that gets him makes, off the hook. And makes Susan look bad. Yeah. Because he's, he's very much like, Susan, you're acting crazy. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, she's not. She's acting like the wronged woman, which she is. But also then at the end, when Brandy is like, this is Mayor. Brandy. I just wanted you to know what happened between me and Carl. Things got out of hand because I thought your marriage was over. I'm sorry. I really am. Thank you. I thought your marriage was over, mm -hmm. and which is something that then he must have told her because how else would Brandy have known that? And, and she plays Brandy like, very young. Like she yeah. plays Brandy very kind of naive yeah. that she did, thought, well, that's the end of that conversation. Like, yeah. <laughs> I definitely agree that that's how like where, cause like Rachel and I have been watching Vanderpump rules and it's shocking how often it comes up in conversation on other things I'm talking about because there's the, all of the girls on that show are very like to the other girls on the show are like, well, you slept with a married man. So you're a whore. And it's like, OK, but like, what about the married man? Mm -hmm. Why aren't you mad at the married man? He's the one that shouldn't be. You can't wreck a happy home. Exactly. He's the one that shouldn't be sleeping with someone else. And so it's just I'm just sort of like, you got to pull back on the whore and start talking about the cheater. That's the problem. With it, which, which, if anything, it actually makes me feel good how far we've come oh yeah how, how much and how far and how it's stayed but i i think it's very very crucial necessary character work for susan because as you mentioned you're like i don't feel like i'm gonna like susan a lot i remember there was a lot of shenanigans she can and come this off, was a shenanigan heavy episode yeah she can come off very shrewish which especially it's especially tonally inconsistent because Every time we check in with Susan, her portion of the episode is a farce. Because mm -hmm. you were like, this is like a Laurel and Hardy. Yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous where it's like she, you know, she goes outside in her towel. It gets trapped in his car door. So she's nude. She and then she's also locked herself out of the house. She's running all around the perimeter of her it, house. It's a comedy of errors. And then but she I... falls in the bushes and Mike sees her. Susan, uh, what you doing? Lock myself out naked. Oh. So how are you? Like, but I do think it was well done. No, it's I fine, think yeah. like you do see 
the mousetrap in yeah. motion, but I think it's done well. And what I'm getting at is we get these moments, usually at the end of the episode, where the episodes will come in really strong, like really sort of like like throttling or like ringing her character. And then they'll pull back at the end because in the previous episode, it was when she realized Mike was still in love with his ex-wife yeah. and she was like, oh, Ooh. okay, I'm going to take, I'm still interested, but I'm going to take a step back. Yeah. And so seeing Like her, just letting it happen organically as opposed to trying to orchestrate these mm-hmm. Or like, falling moments. for this uh, yeah. rivalry with Edie sure. and like, yeah. and so seeing her assessing the situation and really a- as womp womp as she <laughs> is, Doing a good job at every step of the way, mm-hmm. like identifying the emotions and like she considering that. I guess, So I guess what I'm getting is considering she's a very immature character. I think she I think when we get these th- these moments of clarity from her, it, it's the only reason why the character in the show is able to work. Oh, absolutely. And, I'll give you that for sure. And don't underestimate the heavy lifting James Denton is doing. Oh, yeah. I got your messages about dinner, and um, I would love to come if the invite still stands. It's a date. But I um, assume the dress is casual. Yeah, it's, it's casual. He is so charming. He's so handsome and so charming. That back and forth about yeah. like the little peak and stuff. Yeah. It's it, that is one of my favorite tropes. Well, There's I, a take video called The Ethics of Looking that yeah. I find very interesting. I also really like his sort of innuendo laden comments, and especially in front of Brie once they get to the dinner party, and that Susan's like, I'm not ready to laugh about it yet. And then he makes one more joke. I know what just happened is funny in theory, but I'm nowhere near ready to laugh about it. Hey, where have you two been? Uh, Susan had a problem finding something to wear. But she like has she can she, handle it exactly, and I think it's nice. And also, she's the first one to throw herself on the on the sword yeah. when actual shit hit the van. Yeah, fucking Bree, I. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. I I guess. I guess my issue is that you cannot have courted this woman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Finish your thought. You cannot have courted this woman and then be surprised. It's the, the, the Fergie thing. You got Fergie. Yeah. Like you asked for this, you got it. And I think that <clears throat> it's totally fine and totally valid to have issues with relationships and for people to grow or change mm-hmm. or for there to be problems. But he's doing it in such a petulant way. Totally. He's like, I'm unhappy. It's your fault. How are you going to fix it's this? It's also, well, no, it's not even because if it was, how are you going to fix this? You know, she would bend herself into a pretzel to make it work. But the the problem is where I'm with you, where it's like, first of all, you've known her for 20 years. Mm-hmm. You met in college. You're both at least almost 40 you know what she's like. And also you've seen her change because maybe she was a little bit more freewheeling before than she is now. Cause that, sorry, I'm interrupting you. You need to, she is the wife you need her to be for your business. And that's, that's where a little bit, I, I am a little bit on his side with, I was going to get there with the suitcase packing thing. Cause the implication there for me is that this is not the first time that this tableau has played out. So, uh, where are you going? I'll be staying at the Motor Lodge. The hotel by the interstate has better rates, and uh, it's closer to your work. Fine. And he's probably tried to stop her previously to no avail, and he's... So I, I think to a certain extent... It's not quite I've tried nothing and I'm a lot of ideas, but I think he's tried one or two things yeah. and thought, well, it didn't work. So the thing for me, too, is... Where it where this kind of subverts itself is that there's so many men out there who would be like, why aren't you packing my suitcase? You know, and so it's like she is upholding a standard that's so far beyond what he, he wants that he feels like weird about it. But the part where I'm or little, or he's just taken what they've already established. He's just taken for granted. He just genuinely doesn't even realize. Granted, yeah. So the thing for me, the the only part where I'm a little bit on his side is that. But even still, when I go back one more step, I'm not on his side because I think he completely blindsided her with this, like, I'm not happy. I want a divorce. And she's like, well, let's go to counseling. And so he's like going to counseling, but he's not 
doing? He's the generation of man that thinks he can just leave and start over as if he didn't participate in this family that he can just like, I'm not happy. So I'm going to go get an apartment and live my happy life. Yeah. And, And also as though he's not complicit in the way that this relationship turned out, like she's not the only one that created this relationship where he's so unhappy. You Mm -hmm. know, he was involved in that as well. And she is, I mean, she is nutty too. There there was the beds, the bed springs. I'm not saying she's, she's trying to bully him into submission. But also, but again, he's not taking it seriously. No, he's not. Like he's absolutely not taking it seriously. And you're right. He just wants to leave and be like finished with it. And she's like, I refuse to throw this relationship down the toilet like you're doing. I I absolutely refuse. It's interesting because one of the places where the time period really stuck out to me was the shame of the marriage counseling. Yeah. Because 20 years later today, if anything, that would they would they would be broadcasting that and it would make them seem enlightened yeah like it would it would be like oh wow that's really impressive like i'm so proud of you for like so yeah. the the hiding it, it i i i i get it it, it the, the, this that was more of an observation yeah. on my part i just found it interesting because and he i mean he did he does tr- i can't go as far as to say try he goes through the motions he does what he's meant to but he does it so begrudgingly and he's not actually engaging in trying to make it better because he's only doing this because Bree is making him. And in his mind, I think he's like, I'm just going to go through the motions until I can be like, well, this isn't working and, Mm -hmm. and still leave. And I mean, and and also he's just sort of collecting evidence to point at, to be like, see, I tried. It didn't work. No. And like the doctor, Dr. Goldfine is like trying his hardest. Um, but but like in the the way that Rex is like not truly engaging with it, Bree is also doing that thing where she's like looking to the therapist to say, tell me like bullet points of what I need to do to fix this. And it's like, it's not that easy. And also you that's not do that. That's not the point because she's tre- she's treating it like a class. Like yeah. he's a teacher and yeah. she's the star student. Yeah. And she just wants the sticker. And the and... other thing, too, is that they are kind of going round and round where it's like we've heard a little bit of Rex's like issues with this relationship. But whenever we are in the therapist's office, they don't actually talk about what the problems are. Precisely. And that's where. Uh... Like, what is your act? Like, do you feel emasculated because you like can't pack your own suitcase or like, you know, like what is the what's the crux of Rex's mm-hmm. issue? And, and to, to showcase that or to, to, to compare that or contrast that against Lynette and Tom, yeah. where it's like, cause Rex and Brie are not having the conversation yeah. and Rex didn't make margaritas. Mm-hmm. And yes, the margaritas are not enough of and course. the problem is not fixed, but it's uh, 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 my understanding of successful marriage is, you know, dozens of nights like that, mm-hmm. trying, at least attempting, at least temperature gauging and yeah. stuff. Well, and it's like, I think especially in that moment, because so many, so many shows and stuff would take the Lynette, what Lynette does in this episode by like feeding the kids cookies and then leaving Tom at home alone with them as like a, why are you being such a bitch to your husband? The kids are bouncing off the walls, huh? Well, I'm sure you can figure a way to put them to bed, Tom. I mean, for God's sakes, Tom, they're just kids. Whereas Tom actually takes it in stride and is like, I know you gave them cookies, like, nice try. Didn't have a good time? Okay, you know, drop the act. I know you gave them cookies. No, who cracked anyway? But he is being, you know, they're just kids. How hard can it be? Like, I'm so tired from working. And I just, and whereas she is doing a 24 hour a day job while he's out on business. He's, because you said you threw down the word himbo on our watch along. Yeah. If you want to watch along with us, you can head on over to the Patreon at patreon.com slash so watching the show and join in $3 watch tier. He, you said that he's a himbo. It, he, he, he's like the average jock, yeah. like the average dude, where it's like he underestimates. Mm-hmm. Well, it's because, you know, I mean, it's the whole thing that's for like a year now been, you know, the going thing about uh, unequal marriages and relationships and stuff where it's like because he goes out of the house for work and he is the one who brings in the money, he does. he's like, well, you don't have a job anymore. So, like, I'm very tired from my job. And she's like, 
well, I'm very tired from my 24 seven job of caring for your children that you made me give up my career mm-hmm. for. So in that sense, it's like she's doing all of the like emotional labor and the household labor and the child rearing labor. And he just gets to come home and be the fun guy. And so when she finds the pictures of him having like a margarita night out while he was like away on business. Son of a. It's a business meeting. It's a frat party. Regional manager, corporate manager, head of sales. Margarita cigar sombrero. (sighs) She's like. You are not allowed to be tired. You Mm -hmm. had relaxation time while you were gone. Like, you don't get to do this. And like, and that's why she's like, well, you stay home with the kids and I'll go to this party because I already canceled the sitter. And a a second thing that I really appreciate about the show and I appreciate about her character is I I find the Scavos very interesting, Mm -hmm. both of them, but Lynette, because for the entirety of the show, like we meet her sort of doing a thing within a thing. Mm -hmm. Lynette is, she's sort of the um, binder of the group, I guess. Like she's she's sort of, like each of them is a bit too strong an ingredient on their own and Mm -hmm. she needs to sort of like, like spread herself out to make it work. And so even the cookie thing, like that was presented to us like a master scheme. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, he's like, by the way, I know you gave them cookies. Nice try. And she was like, oh, foil. And so it's like, it's that, it's not a hat on a hat, but it's the thing within a thing. Sure. And she does it. It's under that. (laughs) But she does it constantly. Anytime they're together, she makes a joke or or she undercuts the situation to sort of level, to make everything on, on an even playing field. I find it fascinating. Yeah. And I'll say this too. I think. The Scavos so far have the healthiest marriage of the three intact marriages that we see. And they're also the least glamorous. They are the least glamorous. (laughs) But the thing is, is because Gabby very clearly married Carlos for money Mm -hmm. and Brie and Rex are married for um, the way it it looks Mm -hmm. for like status. But I like Lynette and Tom, I believe, are in love with each other. Mm-hmm. And I think that having that at the core of it- Or certainly were and can be again. <laughs> sure. And having that at the core of it, like knowing that they actually like each other and that they are able to have that conversation at the end with the margaritas where Lynette is like- I suggest that we make the most of it. By reliving your night out with the guys? Lynette, I'm trying. You know, it's gonna take more than just this one night. I know. <laughs> Knowing that they're both actually on the same page at the end of the day makes them the most compelling relationship on the show as it stands, Mm -hmm. like right now. And and again, I think you can't discount how good Felicity Huffman and Doug Savant are (laughs) because they are both really good and they're really good at like doing what they do. They're they're like those. Lyndon Ashby and mm. Susan Walter, yeah. where they're ju- like they're a student of like they've just done this. They've played these roles. They just yeah. like solid. They, they both are really good character actors. Mm-hmm. That's just what they're good at, and I love that. Well, one thing I wanted to say was I either didn't appreciate or forgot, probably a combination of the two, how bleak Mary some Alice. of the Mary Alice stuff is. And I think because Brenda Strong is such a warm presence, her narration is yeah. so benevolent it it almost has like a glinda-esque quality that some of the things that she's saying and doing and though some of the ways we're bookending these episodes is like lee yeah and and the way that the show jumps back and forth from tones because that scene with brie going to paul and zach Mm -hmm. where they were talking about the gun is like zach uh, are you okay hello brie Oh, hi, Paul. Thank you, but we already have plans for tomorrow. Oh, that's too bad. It's staggering. (laughs) It's kind of of crazy. And so they also, the police found the box that Paul dumped in the lake at the end of episode two. And it might have human remains in it. Yeah. And we do have more of Gabby's John affair. I for, I just. How many times? Literally, how many times in your mind is it okay for you to say, how was math class to your boyfriend? She calls him and he's in school and you shrieked. Oh, God, he's in math class. (laughs) (laughs) It's only marginally less terrible that she's not his teacher. 
No, she's just his boss. <laughs> Technically, Carlos is his boss. <laughs> and and then he was like in algebra class. <laughs> How old is he? Like I know I took algebra. He to turns senior, eighteen, but okay, so I think he turns right eighteen. Now. I think I remember he turns eighteen on the show. I mean, it's not great. No, it's not. But one thing I do, I I do like how little Gabby cares. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that it makes it okay; it doesn't. But I do like how callous she is, yeah. and I find it interesting. And it does sort of. Remind me a little bit of the conversation we have about America Ferrera sometimes, where oh, it's like sure. she's not afraid to to play a certain type of character or a character yeah. a certain way, and I I think because it was in the last the last episode, but it was in the preview for this episode where John like asks her like why she's doing this, and she's like, "Why are we doing this?" Because I don't want to wake up one morning with a sudden urge to blow my brains out. And it's shocking. You're like, oh, God. Yeah. And it it kind of does sort of like, well, I mean, within a bubble, yeah. in within the bubble she's in, it does justify or certainly narratively. It makes it it makes it make makes a it make an amount of sense. sense yeah. Uh, and also, I mean, she the way that her marriage operates and the fact that like everybody knows that it, it was like for money for her and for, you know, a trophy wife for Carlos mm-hmm. It, I mean, having an affair with the pool boy, like, just makes sense. Like, that's, like, a trope as old as time. And the, the casting of that child. Okay. So we're good. Right? Okay. Oh, yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. That she's just this weird, surly, <laughs> almost like an old soul. Yeah. And she's kind of a brat in a little rascal's way, but... It's just because Gabby is kind of so awful, you just kind of love seeing her be put through this. Bend over backwards, yeah. Is really... The, okay. <laughs> it's really fun. The part that got me the worst about the Gabby and John stuff was when she was like, come over after school, which again, how many times d- does your brain make that make you say it wasn't, that It sentence? wasn't the stinky gym clothes? Yes, it was. <laughs> because he was like, do you want me to wear my gym clothes again? Again, which means that she specifically requested that once before. <laughs> it's so weird. Disgusting. It's, well, because it's gross. Just, <laughs> just as a sex thing, it's gross. But we don't kink shame. So it's sort of like whatever. But when the part of that that would be intriguing is not copacetic with yeah. the teenage yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> also, is that, is it like his, his sweaty gym clothes from school? Is that better than the sweaty clothes he wears when he does your yard? Yeah. <laughs> What's people, the difference? I don't know. That was a staggering piece of dialogue yeah. <laughs> that they were able to get through yeah. because it, it asked so many questions. So many. <laughs> we also, when I did actually shriek in the episode is when Brie lets... Let D- slip. Doesn't let slip. She very purposefully. <laughs> she makes it. And with her whole calculated chest. decision. Rex cries <gasps> after he ejaculates. <laughs> Which that then also begs further questions because it's like after he masturbates too, like every ejaculation or only during sex with Bree. I'm curious now. You open the door. Well, we get into it. Oh no! I mean, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember if there's a specific like I cry when I ejaculate, yada yada. But that's part of his issue is he's not sexually fulfilled. Okay, I mean, talk about that with your <laughs> spouse. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and not at the one dinner party a year. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing too is. So, like, when she is packing his suitcase at the end, she still is being, like, a a good wife because she's like, I'm packing your swim trunks because I know how swimming relaxes you. She has duty. And she the has a duty to do. that you're going to has a pool. He's just ungrateful. He just seems ungrateful. <laughs> I know that Brie is a pill, <laughs> but Rex is Twist. Un- ungrateful. <laughs> you're coming down on Brie. <laughs> Uh, well, I've always liked Marsha Cross. Too, uh-huh. So, oh, also, apparently, Lynette and Tom tried to have sex on Mister Toad's Wild Ride, which is insane <laughs> to me. 
But that's kind of an example of what I mean with Lynette is yeah. because I take that in world with a grain of salt. Sure. Not that I think she's lying, but I think that she's playing into this character of hers. Sure. Yes. Because yeah. she says she says they got perp walked down Main Street USA. Yeah. They like got kicked out of Disneyland for for lewd behavior. Yeah. Which, I mean, that could be them being too drunk. That could be them. I mean, he could have just been getting like handsy and stuff. Yeah, of course. It's whatever. But it, but like, I, but yeah. I'm saying like her throwing the detail of Mr. Toad's wild ride. Mm-hmm. I could see that just being a joke she's making. Because that is like that. If I were to pick out of all of the rides at Disney, that I would. Like, <laughs> we're going to make a tiered list. <laughs> outside of Space Mountain, I think Mr. Toad is like at the bottom of the list. Like at least the, it's a small world with Ross uh, on friends makes sense. yeah, but that one's unhinged because he says like they climb behind some of the dolls and you don't touch that water. Yeah. Anyone who knows, <laughs> you don't get out of that boat. <laughs> Regardless, yeah. we're gonna watch the next episode. Yep. Okay. Bye. Bye. Like and subscribe. I don't know. You know what you're supposed to do. Help us. You do some heavy lifting. Help us help you. 